Right. Good afternoon. Welcome to our afternoon colloquium. Uh, today I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our speaker, Dr. Christian Duobny, uh, who is going to be talking about optics of OSIRIS-REx mission, and I think it's a really exciting mission, uh, so I'm really looking forward to this. And by the way of introduction, uh, Dr. Duobny is a graduate of our own college. He graduated uh, with a PhD in optical sciences in 2003, and since then he has uh, served in various roles as a lab, lab manager at the Stewart Observatory. Subsequently, he uh, worked on new technology for interferometric beam com combiners for NASA's Terrestrial Planet Finder mission, and on the optical design of various ground-based <coughs> astronomical instruments. And uh, thereafter, he joined uh, a, a uh, startup company, TerraVision Incorporated, and he served as the Vice President of Engineering, uh, where he helped develop terahertz radar imaging and spectroscopy technology for security applications before returning to University of Arizona, and where he's been uh, working on the OSIRIS-REx uh, team. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Dugan. Thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk here. So. Uh, the talk's going to be on OSIRIS-REx. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, asteroids, why we want to go there, a little bit about the mission itself. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, remote sensing cameras and instruments that are on the uh, uh, OSIRIS-REx uh, spacecraft. And then I'll focus a little more also on the three cameras that we've built and developed here at the university. So OSIRIS-REx, it's the largest grant U of, U of A ever got. It's about a billion dollars. It's $800 million for the mission, $200 million for the uh, rocket. Uh, about a quarter of that is coming to Tucson, or has come to Tucson. There's about 700 collaborators. I looked at the project roster. We have 666 people on the roster, so we're about to take over the world. Uh, <clears throat> three countries involved, US, Canada, and France. Uh, we have about 120 science team members. Half of them are going to relocate to Tucson when we get to the asteroid. And uh, we're going to launch next year in September, and the sample return is uh, seven years later. So OSIRIS tracks on the College of Optical Sciences. So uh, College of Optical Sciences built one of the three instruments, the Polycam. Uh, also helped us with the design of MapCam and SAMCam. And I may have missed a couple, but when I try to think of everybody who was on the project, there's at least 22 uh, OPSI alumni that worked on the project. So if you don't see your name on there, I'm sorry, but I try to think of everybody. <clears throat> so like any good NASA mission, OSIRIS REx is a long and complicated acronym. In our case, it stands for Origin, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, and Regolith Explorer. So Origins, the idea is we're going to go to an asteroid that is more or less pristine from the time the solar system formed. and that will let us find out what material was in the very early solar system without having been processed on Earth by various geology and uh, weather. Uh, also, the spectral interpretation of it is basically to help us relate what we see with telescopes, ground-based or at least Earth-based, to the reality of an asteroid when we, once we get there. The resource identification part is to use spectroscopy and the sampling we're going to do at this asteroid to identify what resources are available on asteroids, whether it's water or carbon molecules or anything like that for further exploitation. Security is, the security aspect of this mission is to understand a little bit better how the orbit of asteroids evolves as a re result of solar radiation and something called the Yarkovsky effect. And finally, Regolith Explorer is because the first time the mission proposal was uh, submitted, it was called OSIRIS. And then the next time you submit to NASA, you have to submit a different name. So they call it OSIRIS-REx. And the REx part is basically saying that we're going to go explore the regolith, which is the material that's at the surface of the asteroid. All right, so asteroids, I think most people in this audience have heard about asteroids, but I'm going to talk very briefly about what they are and when they were first discovered. It started around 1801, and there were, the reason why they were never discovered before is you have to have a telescope to see an as asteroid. The br biggest, brightest one is magnitude 6, which is just out of reach of the best eyes uh, out there. And so 1801 is the first time somebody found one, the brightest one. Uh, and then as the uh, maps of the sky got better and better, we found about 
2000 by 1960. And so this is all using photographic plates and things like that. And then as we got better detectors, better telescopes, and started looking for them more systematically, we found a whole lot more. So by now we found about 600,000 asteroids out there. And, and we think that's about 1% of what's out there. What, what we think the completeness of our survey is about a 1% level at this point. So most asteroids live in the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter. And then as a result of something I will show a little bit later, this Tsiolkovsky effect, they, some of them start moving inward towards Mars or towards Earth. And some of them also move the other way. So this animation basically shows you from 1980. Um, this is a, a view of the solar system with the sun in the center, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter here. And what flashes is every time a new asteroid was discovered. So the first thing you can notice is we discover them when they're close to Earth, and we discover them at night. So we discover them in the direction that's opposite the sun. I mean, I think that, that all makes sense. That's when we look at the sky. And then what you can see also is that we start discovering more and more. The other thing that you can probably start noticing, which will become more and more obvious, is there's this pulsating uh, characteristics where we find uh, you, know, you can see these flashes and then it goes away. And that's basically the phases of the moon. The asteroids are pretty faint. If we want to find them, we have to go look at them when the moon is out of the way. When there's a full moon, the sky's too bright, you can't see them. And so every time there's a new moon, there's campaigns and they go and they look and they find a whole bunch. Uh, in this picture, it's going to become more obvious as we find more and more as time goes on. The green ones are ones that are basically confined between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. And then there's going to be some of them that are going to be yellow, which are the ones that cross the orbit of Mars, and red ones, the ones that come close to Earth, the ones that are potentially dangerous or potentially interesting, depending how you want to think about them. Uh, as time goes on, you can s see that we're picking up more and more. And basically what's happening here is we're starting having CCD technology and things that are more and more sensitive and that yield themselves to be reduced by computers, where the computer can go and compare this tonight's picture to yesterday's picture and find out, hey, there's a new object, let's track it. Uh, so you can see more and more being found. Another thing that's interesting is, if you look, if you start paying attention in, in this quadrant here, somehow there's just not nearly as much asteroids that are being found. You can, you can see this kind of dark region. Um, <clears throat> and the reason for that is because that's the monsoon season in Arizona. It's raining in Arizona, and so we're just not finding asteroids. So that's kind of a, one of the Arizona connections to asteroids. Okay, it's almost done, but let me just go on to the next slide. So one of the reasons why the monsoon matters is 52% of all known asteroids have been discovered by the University of Arizona. And if you, so this is this red and this uh, uh, blue chart. Then this light blue is uh, Lowell Observatory, so that's Arizona as well. And linear is New Mexico. So this is the whole section of asteroids being discovered that's affected by the weather of the southwest uh, of the US. It's kind of a fun fact. All right, so another connection to University of Arizona is this pioneer like Michael Drake, who was the original PI of the OSIRIS-REx mission, who started associating uh, meteorites to particular asteroids. So basically looking at the geology of those meteorites and their color and their spectroscopy, he was able to start saying, okay, this looks like this asteroid and this looks like that asteroid. And so, therefore, it must have come by from some common parent or something like that. And so, by starting to look at these samples, we can start understanding what was in the solar system at the time. Of course, these samples, they've fallen to Earth, right? So they've, they've gone through the atmosphere, they got baked, they've been on the ground for however long, so they've gotten water and contaminated and fallen apart. So what we really want is something that's pristine. We want something that you know, hasn't gone through that whole process so we can find out what's in it. Especially if we're looking for, you know, some of those meteorites have metal in them, 
Well, metal goes through the atmosphere pretty well. Right? Some of them are rocks like those, and that also goes through the atmosphere pretty well. But if you want to look at something that has maybe water on it or carbon molecules or organics, well, when it goes to the atmosphere, it's just going to vaporize. So the only way you're going to be able to look at a sample of that is to actually go there. So looking at these samples, uh, they concluded that they all came from the same body. Now, that's interesting because they're very different kinds of material. And so from that, they concluded that it had to come from a body that was differentiated. So something where a core had form and a cross had form and, you know, and they, from the colors, they decided it must be from Vesta. And this is the best picture we can take from Earth. Not even from Earth, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it's not a very good picture. I think it's, we all want a better picture. But even in that picture, you can tell something's wrong. And so just in the last couple of years, NASA has sent a mission called Dawn over there. And what it found was, this is what Vesta looks like. Uh, sort of a, a potato rate of revolution, but it has this big old crater. So 90% of the size of that uh, uh, minor planet is a crater. That's, you know, this is like, as, if this was on Earth, it would cover all of America and South America, and it's just enormous. And so there was, a long time ago, there was this huge impact, basically shattered a, bill, a big chunk of this, and some of those meteorites came and uh, fell on Earth. And the interesting thing is, the ability to predict by looking at these samples that this must have happened to Vesta and then go there and find out that it really happened. So it's going to need to have those analytical tools on the ground that allow you to tell something before you go there. But there is still a lot of value in going there because this is an example of a, a comet called 67P. It has a very uh, uh, interesting name. And before we went there, this is what people thought it would look like. And this is what it looked like when we got there. So, you know, even though looking at things and trying to understand from the ground is helpful, going there has a lot of value. And that's part of why we're going. So asteroids have been the bringers of destructions, right? They've wiped the dinosaurs. Um, <clears throat> and this is where it happened, Yucatan. Uh, they left a crater that's 110 miles in diameter. It's all underground, so you can't see it. It was discovered by the Mexican uh, like gas exploration company uh, and then recognized by people at the University of Arizona. Uh, <clears throat> and so this was 65 million years ago, and so it's kind of like, well, do we really care about stuff that happened 65 million years ago? Well, you don't have to drive very far to see something that happened just 50,000 years ago and did a lot of damage. This is the meteor crater near Winslow, Arizona. I assume many of you have been there. And so this is a body that was probably about 50 meters across. And 50 meters doesn't sound that big. I mean, it's, it's big, but it's not huge. But what you have to remember is this is going at 26,000 miles per hour by the time it hits the Earth. And so that's an awful lot of kinetic energy. In fact, that's, you know... Um, the equivalent of 20 megaton of TNT. So that's like the biggest atomic bomb you know you can go and get anywhere. Um, and they're not just historical curiosity. So there was a very big event at the beginning of the century in Siberia. And that basically flattened 2,000 square kilometers of forest, where everything got burned, all the trees got flattened. So this is 100 years ago. And then just a couple of years ago, there was an explosion over Chelyabinsk in Russia. I don't know if you, you guys remember, it was on TV. And so the good thing about this is it happened at 100,000 feet in, up in the atmosphere. And so it didn't actually go and impact the ground. But if it had, it would have been a, a pretty bad day in Russia. And then here I have something that basically shows you for the last 20 years, places where there's been hits of something that was at least a meter in diameter. And this is, for example, Chelyabinsk, this is think, thought to be about 20 meters in diameter, and it's, it's right here. So, you know, it's a lot of hits. So there's a legitimate concern about asteroids. And then you can look at all the asteroids that are near-Earth asteroids that are potentially dangerous, uh, starting from the little ones that are the size of what happened a couple years ago to the big ones that could wipe out all civilization. And then how many we think are out there based on the fact that we only have discovered about 1%. So one of the reasons why we care about going there and understanding them better is because we can't just study the orbit of asteroids based on gravity alone. 
uh, what happens is actually a, a neat optical effect. The sun is shining on one side, and as the asteroid is rotating, it's emitting infrared radiation. And by doing so, it's cooling off. And so the direction in which it's uh, emitting radiation is basically, you know, as the asteroid is turning here, it's emitting light this way. And it's actually slowing it down. And so as an asteroid rotates, the, the light that it's emitting, it's slowing it down in its, in its orbit. And, you know, over a very small period of time, it doesn't seem like it's a very large force, but you have to understand that those are pretty small bodies. They're, you know, hundreds of meters across, the biggest ones, or maybe a kilometer across. And it's a pretty decent amount of slowing down. And so, for example, the one that is the target of OSIRIS-REx has been measured by radar very precisely over the last 12 years. And so over the last 12 years, its trajectory has deviated by about 160 kilometers from what we would predict based on gravity. And so, you know, 160 kilometers, that's not that much, but it's just 12 years. And 160 kilometers is enough to go or not go through what's called a keyhole. And so basically, when we look at the orbits of these asteroids, we can forecast that in about 200 years, they're going to come really close to Earth. And when they do, depending on whether they go through this keyhole that's maybe a thousand kilometer wide, somewhere between the Earth, the Earth and the Moon, for example, they will either go off and never come back, or they will come back and hit the Earth a couple revolutions later. And so it's really important to understand where an asteroid is going with a precision that is not possible to do with gravity alone. So you have to understand the type of materials that are at the surface, so you understand how they absorb light and also how they re-emit light. And then the, the last reason uh, for going there is planetary resources. And so that seems really far-fetched, like something that you know is not going to happen for hundreds of years. But it cost about $10,000 to put one pound of water into orbit. So you know, if you want to have astronauts up there, you know, and they're going to drink a little bottle of water, it's about $10,000. And a single one of these asteroids would have enough for you know, years and years and years. And with water, you can make rocket fuel, you can make drinkable water, and you can make air, too, by just dissociating the water into oxygen and hydrogen. The other thing is some asteroids have uh, things from the platinum group, things like platinum, palladium, rhodium, which are very expensive and very rare metals on Earth. And so if you could mine just one asteroid, the potential value is, you know, they have something like $3 trillion. And so, of course, it's, it's not easy. But at the same time, these are materials that are in very, very short supply on Earth. And so those are kind of the two low-hanging fruit. Getting water to supply uh, our activity in space already, because water is so expensive to bring to space, or having other materials that are very hard to find on Earth. OK. so. The idea is that hopefully by now you guys agree that we should go to an asteroid and this would be a, a worthy endeavor. What can we do? So we have some limits on where we can go with the rocket technology that we have. Right? And so in order to have a mission that doesn't have some giant solar panels, we can't go very much farther than 1.6 astronomical units. That's the dis one astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the Earth. Uh, and from thermal constraints, we don't want to go too much inside of Earth's orbit because things get really toasty there. And you start having problems with electronics and various other chemical things. Um, the other thing is if you don't want to have to use a huge, huge rocket, you want to limit the, um, how far out of plane out of the plane of the solar system we're going to go. Right? And so that's about 10 degrees. And then the last thing is you want to go someplace that has an orbit that is well known enough that you're going to be able to get there, get close enough, and then start navigating to it. Because if you, if you don't know its position really well, you're going to go in your spacecraft, and then you're going to be in the middle of nowhere, and you won't know where to go. So we go from somewhere over half a million asteroids to about 7,000 7, that are near Earth. Only about 200 of those meet all the criteria on the previous page, saying that you know, they're close enough, not too far, not too, not too high, not too low. Out of these, about 26 are larger than 200 meters. 
So there's two reasons why we care that we want to go to a large asteroid. Uh, the first one is in order for them to be dangerous, well, they have to be big enough to do something. But the, the second more practical one is that the smaller asteroids tend to rotate really fast. And so if you're trying to land on one, you don't want to have to try and spin you know, really, really fast and try and land just there. So the one we're going to, for example, has a four-hour rotation period. So its day is four hours. And so four hours is something that, you know, it's, it's pretty quick, but we can match it. If it was five minutes, it would be nearly impossible. Right? And some asteroids are like that. And then out of those 25, about a fifth are carbonaceous. And I mentioned before, those are the ones that we think are the most interesting from a, science, uh, from a scientific standpoint because we don't have that many of them in our collection on Earth because they don't go through the atmosphere very well and also because they're the ones that are likely to have molecules that were uh, critical to the beginning of life on Earth. And that leads to the one we chose, RQ36, which is, out of all of these, the most likely to hit the Earth in about 150 years. It's about one chance in a thousand, roughly, at this point, based on what we know. So, at this point, this is what we think Bennu looks like. Of course, we're not going to know until we get there. But because this asteroid we're going to is the one that is the most likely to hit us in a reasonably short time, and because there's a billion dollar mission going to it, there's been a lot of observations with pretty much all the telescope all the way around the Earth, from radio telescopes to infrared telescope to space telescope, trying to understand as much as we can about it. So it's about a third of a mile in diameter. We know that much. It turns on itself every four hours. Its orbit is such that every time the Earth goes around the sun five times, the asteroid goes around the sun six times. So every Every six years, we basically see this asteroid up close. And so we have a window to go to it, a window to look at it. Uh, based on the density, the, we, we have a number of uh, tools <clears throat> that have been used to determine the density of it. And we think it's about just over a gram per centimeter cube. So it's just a little more than water. And it's got to be rock. So we know it's pretty loosely packed. There's got to be a lot of holes in there. Uh, <clears throat> And it's very dark. Its, its reflectivity is on the order of 3%. So that's about as reflective as black paint, which creates some interesting challenges for optics that go and try and image black paint in space. Uh, don't know what happened here. Sorry. OK. <laughs> I apologize. There it goes. Yeah, I tried the animation earlier. So we've managed to g determine its orbit very precisely. Uh, we know it's uh, something like 10 kilometers. Uh, it's nearly spherical. Uh, there's one little rock that's been detecting by radar. Uh, it's somewhere out here. You can see a little bright spot here once in a while. And uh, based on the light curve of it, we don't think there are any satellites in orbit. So the, the reason we care about that is we want to go into orbit. And so if there's already a natural satellite, it's potentially a problem. So it's nice to know that there's uh, not too much likelihood that there is one. Oh, that's, that's a little bump. That bump is thought to be about 10 meters. And the ultimate goal of the mission is to hold a sample of basically the origins of the solar system in our hand that we can analyze here on Earth with the uh, best in US technology for a very long time. So we're about here. We've spent the last four years developing the concept of the mission, designing the instruments, building them, testing them, putting them on the spacecraft. We're launching in September of 2016. Uh, a year later, the spacecraft is going to come back by the Earth and do an Earth gravity assist to get out of the plane of the ecliptic. And then three years later, uh, we're going to get to the asteroid. We're going to be there for uh, about two years. And then it's a three-year trip back. So it's a pretty long mission, especially if you think of some of the people who we're working with who've been trying to propose this for about 10 years before. So by the time this is done, these people will have worked on the mission for about 25 years. <clears throat> All right, so this is launching. So we have a month-long launch window from Earth. And th those three dots are just three different dates, the beginning, the middle, and the end of the launch window. 
And so this shows about after a year, there's an Earth gravity assist, and we start following the orbit of Bennu, slowly catching up to it. And then after uh, two more Earth years, we get to it. All right, then I have a little video from NASA uh, that shows you their concept. Um, <clears throat> so parts of it are accelerated. One of the things that's interesting about OSIRIS-REx is uh, typically when NASA goes and explores something, they will send a first mission to go maybe take some image, get some idea of what the world is like. And then the next time they might try and send a lander. And then the next time they might try and send something that collects a sample and analyzes, is in, analyzes it in situ. And then maybe later they send another mission to get a sample and bring it back. The idea here is we're going to do all of this in one shot. So we're going to look at the asteroid with a whole bunch of different remote sensing instruments. And then we're just going to go and try and sample directly from the surface and bring the sample back. <coughs> which is the part that's being shown here. So, um, If you guys have any questions, just stop me. So this is the, the sample return capsule. So the, the part that's been sampled is being put in it. And then when the, when the Osiris Rex comes back to Earth, the sample return capsule is going to go back through the Earth's atmosphere. It's going to fall in the Utah desert and uh, be collected, be taken to the Johnson Space Flight Center where they have all the collections from uh, Apollo and other missions that have gone out there to uh, collect samples. So the minimum that we consider a success is about 60 grams. Uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, tests, and most of the tests get about a pound. Okay, so what do we need to make this happen? So this is a picture of, our, uh, of the osiris Wake spacecraft. Uh, so there's a bus, which is basically the same thing as MAVEN. I don't know if you guys have heard about MAVEN. It's a, a satellite that's orbiting Mars right now, sampling its atmosphere. So they've reused the same design. There's a sample return capsule here. There's an arm with a sampler head that's going to go get the sample. There's a big uh, antenna to talk to uh, back to Earth. Got some small, very, uh, very efficient uh, solar panels. One of the reasons why they're small and efficient is because if you're going to go touch something, you don't want to have those giant solar panels just you know, flapping around. Um, <clears throat> and then in terms of remote sensing, we have a number of instruments ranging the whole electromagnetic spectrum. There's a, a small instrument contributed by students at MIT, which is a, an X-ray fluorescence instrument. Uh, there's a three OCAMS camera that were built here at the University of Arizona. There's a visible and infrared spectrometer that's built by Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, a, th a thermal emission spectrometer uh, that's uh, from ASU. And there's also a, uh, a laser altimeter uh, it's contributed by the Canadian Spa Space Agency. And we also take advantage of Doppler effects that are measured in the communication stream from the spacecraft to see how the spacecraft is accelerating or decelerating while it's in orbit to get some information about the mass uh, of the uh, asteroid. So this is the three cameras that we built here, the SAM cam. Its job is to basically do a, a video or a movie of the approach to the asteroid and the actual sampling event. Uh, and then after the sampling event, uh, the idea is to use SAMCAM to look back at the sampling canister to see if we managed to, got, to get uh, a sample from the surface. And if we didn't, the camera has to work again for two more tries. Um, <clears throat> the MAPCAM, it's a color camera, and its job is basically to uh, create maps, as the name imply, of the asteroid and also to look at the geology to give us an idea of maybe where materials are more interesting than other may be located. And the polycam, which is the camera that was built here, uh, its job is to help navigate to the asteroid so it's sensitive enough that it can find the asteroids from a couple million uh, kilometers away. 
And then it has to work all the way down to something like 150, 200 meters from the surface and provide uh, essentially centimeter scale resolution of uh, images of the planet, of the, of the asteroid. Uh, the idea being that we don't want to go to a place where there's going to be uh, pebbles and rocks that are so big that they're going to prevent our sampling uh, mechanism from working. And so we're going to Im image the surface of the asteroid at centimeter or sub-centimeter resolution to make sure that there is material there that can be sampled and also that there isn't rocks and things that are going to get in the way. Uh, that's a picture of the, the osiris Rex laser altimeter. Uh, and uh, so it works from out about seven kilometers and gives something like five centimeter resolution, both uh, uh, in, in ranging and cross range. Uh, so this is a picture of OVS, which is the uh, visible infrared spectrometer. And it, it uh, provides point uh, spectra from 0.4 to about 4 micron. Uh, OTES, the camera built at ASU, or the, the spectrometer built at ASU, picks up from, from here and goes longward. And then the radio science, which is basically listening to the Doppler shift in the communication, tells us about the mass, the gravity, and uh, this is a picture of uh, Rexis, the uh, X-ray uh, spect spectrometer slash imager from MIT. All right, so this is a, a picture. It's a little movie. It's going it's to start in a minute. So this is done on the Vomit Comet. So you know, I've, you can go on an airplane that does zero gravity flight, and you can bring your sample canister. You can bring some rocks, and you can simulate what would happen in vacuum when you blow nitrogen. So the idea being. In vacuum, in, if you're already in a vacuum, you can't use a vacuum to suck the rocks at the surface. You have to do something else. And so the idea is to push nitrogen like this, and then the nitrogen goes and mobilizes the regolith, the rocks at the surface of uh, the asteroid, and then it forces them out through a filter. And so the the, the gas mobilizes the rocks. The rocks have to go somewhere. The gas is able to escape, but the rocks get stuck in this uh, little labyrinth with filters. And so this has been tried hundreds and hundreds of times, and every time we get lots of material. We've tried it you know, with different kinds of rocks, different size of rocks. And so as long as we're able to stay in a region of where the rocks are not too big or not too small, then you know, it, it works. And that's basically the concept that makes Osiris Rex possible. So this is a picture of the actual head that's on the spacecraft right now. And one of the interesting things about it is we're spending a billion dollars to go get somewhere around 100 gram of that material. So if you make the math, it's very expensive material by the time it comes back. And the last thing we want to do is have some Christian DNA or some Dathan DNA on it, right? And so this is probably one of the cleanest thing on Earth that's ever been made because this is where we're going to get our sample. This is where it's going to go. And it's just this huge amount of effort going into keeping it clean and a huge amount of perhaps paranoia in keeping everything else that has a view of it clean. So our cameras have a view of this, right? So there's, this, there's a worry that there's some sort of transfer mechanism for anything that would be at the surface of our camera to it. And so that means our camera had to be very clean, which we've partially succeeded. <laughs> and so this is a picture of the, the spacecraft here at Lockheed Martin, and uh, the arm extended here to give you a, a sense of, of how big uh, this is. And uh, an, inter an interesting thing about this is all the motors and everything is designed to work in zero gravity. And so they're not really sized to move the arms or anything on Earth. So this whole thing hangs from a giant helium balloon that's just floating in this giant hangar. And that's, that's the only way it's able to move. And this is kind of, you know, a, you feel like you're a little bit up or something because, you know, you have this giant helium balloon just to lift this little flimsy arm. Uh, and so another aspect of a space mission is you want to have tested everything, right? Because you don't want to get into space and all of a sudden something doesn't work. You can't open it. You can close it. And so this is part of a test that was done fairly recently where the whole sequence of, you know, taking the arm out, deploying it, uh, 
doing a fake sampling event and then stowing it away and taking pictures uh, uh, was done. All right, so now this is the part of the talk where I want to tell you a little bit about the various remote sensing instruments that are on board the spacecraft. This is the uh, instrument that was built at, uh, re at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. It's a fairly simple optical instrument. It's two off-axis parabola. Uh, the whole box on all the optics are all machined out of aluminum so that uh, as the temperature changes when we go from being in space away from everything, which is going to be really cold, to being in close proximity to an asteroid that's black and therefore is very hot. So to keep all the optical tolerances, this whole thing is made of aluminum. And the way the spectrometer works is it has um, these uh, linear variable filters in front of its focal plane. And so depending on where you are on the focal plane, you see light of different uh, wavelength. The people who make the, the, the filters is JDS Uniphase, but really uh, you've all seen these filters because JDS Uniphase actually bought Oakley. So if you've ever seen Oakley sunglasses, this is the technology that was developed. Never mind, it went the other way around. They developed technology for sunglasses and then we used it. <laughs> so uh, it's a five inch telescope. Uh, it, it goes from 0 0.4 to about 4 micron. Um, and it was essentially a, a rebuild of a couple of previous instruments. And so they had the, a lot of effort to make it work and get everything as safe as possible. One of the uh, anecdotes I wanted to bring up is when we first started Osiris Rex, I remember a, a NASA risk person coming here and asking us about our fire plan and our earthquake plan. And I was like, You've got to be kidding me, right? So Ovirs, they had this very, very nice fancy aluminum box, and they sent it to the flight and the fly spare. They sent it to get coated. Well, the whole factory burned down. And so they had to get really creative in a hurry to replace these. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe there is something to the fire plan and what you're going to do if the whole facility burns down. All right, so this is the uh, uh, Osiris Rex Thermal Emission Spectrometer. This was built at ASU, and basically it's a six-inch Casgrain telescope, and in this box here is a small Michelson Fourier transform spectrometer. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is they used to use cesium iodide as a beam splitter uh, just because of the, the range of wavelength they have to cover. And it's very hygroscopic material. It's a very fragile material. And so one of the novel things uh, for OTAS is they actually, this time, used a CVD-grown diamond uh, uh, <clears throat> beam splitter. The other interesting thing is it's an interferometer. And we all know interferometers are not very good with vibration. So you know they go through a lot of testing and a lot of things to make sure it's going to work in a somewhat noisy environment. I mean, spacecraft are not as quiet as a vibration isolated table. And so they went through all the testing. They went to integration. They put the instrument on the spacecraft, and everything was hunky-dory. And then about three months later, the instrument stopped working. And so ASU got a call. It's like, your instrument doesn't work anymore. So they went to Lockheed and found out it still didn't work. They couldn't make it work. So they decided to take it off the spacecraft, which nobody wants to do. I mean, I can't imagine having to go back and take one of our cameras off the spacecraft. I don't even want to think about it. But they had to do that. But, and before they shipped it to ASU, they said, well, let's test it one more time. And all of a sudden, it worked again. And that's when they realized that there is a nitrogen purge to the instrument because we don't want to have the instrument sitting for six months or a year before launch without you know, any protection. So the nitrogen purge helps you keep the dust out, keep the humidity out. Well, Lockheed said the purge wrong. And so they put way too much air through it. And just the microphonics from the air going through basically broke the uh, uh, Michelson interferometer. So they just dialed down the air, and everything was fine again. So there was nothing wrong with the instrument, but 
just to say, you know, Michelson interferometer is very sensitive to vibration in retrospect. Uh, just some pictures of OTES going uh, through testing at um, ASU. All right, the Osiris Rex laser altimeter. So this is a Canadian Space Agency contribution. Uh, it uses three uh, neodymium YAG lasers. Uh, there's two low power one, one high power one. Um, and it uses a flexure mounted scanning mirror. And this mirror is the reason why this instrument is not on, spa on the spacecraft right now. Because they went to vibe like everybody else. But their mirror broke. And you know, uh, everybody knows scanning mirrors are very difficult. We, in my previous life, we built some system that had scanning mirrors. And it's very tricky to build an optical component that's lightweight enough that you can move it very, very fast. Anyway, but they fixed it. There was a design issue. They fixed it. And it's going to be on the spacecraft in a couple months. Uh, REXIS is a student-built instrument. So all students, I mean, they have some faculty advisors, obviously, but all the work is done by students, all the design and everything. And they've been working really hard and running through some, a lot of issues, actually. But uh, it looks like they will be on the spacecraft, too. But as of right now, there's just a break that's simulating the, the mass of their instrument until they're able to go. In addition to all of these, there's two navigation cameras that are provided by Million Space Science. And also uh, another little camera that's basically looking at the uh, sample return capsule to document when the arm goes in to make sure that there is nothing that's going to prevent the capsule from closing correctly. And there's also, uh, in addition to the Canadian LIDAR, there's a, a navigation LIDAR. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit more detail about OCAMS, which is the part that was run at U of A. Uh, <clears throat> so, one of the difference with all the previous instruments is OCAM is actually flight critical. The idea being that we cannot go to the asteroid and land on it unless we have some way, some sort of eyes to look at it, find where it is, find where we want to land, and actually see what we're doing. And just these two little words make everything more difficult because it means the technology has to be proven to be ready. There's, got, there's prototyping, there's testing, there's lots of more testing, and then a lot more paperwork. Uh, it was, ended up costing about $40 million. It was delivered on budget and about one month early. Uh, we had a core team of about 45 people with uh, an extra 50 contractors that came in, worked for some amount of time, and, and then left. So there's three instruments. And for an instrument that's flight critical, typically what you would have is you would have two of them. You wouldn't fly just one. You would have two instruments. In case one of them breaks, you'd have another one that would still work. Uh, here with three cameras, that would become prohibitively expensive, right? Both in terms of mass and in terms of money. That means you'd have to have six cameras. And so we have a slightly different concept here, which is rather than have redundant instruments, we have a functional redundancy where we can get the same resolution, we can cover, we can get the same type of images that's needed with one camera with at least one of the other cameras. So for example, we want to be able to take images uh, of the asteroid with one centimeter resolution or better. Well, we can do that with the polycam from 200 meters, or we can do that from mapcam from 30 meters, or we could do it with samcam from three meters away. I mean, obviously those are different concepts, and you know, it's a lot nicer to know where you're going when you're 200 meters away than when you're 30 meters away, but if you had to, you could get a little, a little closer to get those images. And so we always have this functional redundancy where one camera can, one or the two cameras can replace uh, one of the other cameras. So this is the SAM cam. This is our baby. It's about, it's about this big around. And it's basically, it's a wide field camera. It has a six position filter wheel. And it has three clear filters. The idea being that if you go to the asteroid and you have one try and something goes wrong, you could get dust or something that covers the front of the optics. And so we have two more positions that we can use to do two more attempts. And then we also have a, a diopter in that filter wheel that allows us to refocus the camera to look a little closer at the sampling head to take really detailed images. Uh, the map cam, that's your standard telephoto camera. 
and it has an eight position filter wheel and so that's how we get color images. We have a blue filter, a green filter, a red filter, an infrared filter, and we're able to make images by taking three pictures or four pictures of the sampling. Uh, it also has uh, a, a, what we call a pan filter, which is really broad, allows us to take pictures with shorter exposures. Um, <clears throat> and one thing I didn't mention for SAMCAM is all three cameras have some sort of internal calibration. So one of the filter in each of the camera is something that allows you to turn it on and get a sense of how sensitive the camera is. One of the challenges of a space mission that's going to be out there for five years is radiation. And so you worry about degradation of both the optics and the sensor. So we go a long way in trying to get glass that is rad hard and trying to get filters that use rad hard materials and test our detectors. But at the same time, you know you can't go to an environment where there's so much radiation without having some sort of degradation. And so we are bringing our own light source to be able to do some test. And then this is the polycam. This is the camera that was built here. Uh, it's a 630 millimeter F3 telescope. It's, a, it's an eight inch telescope. And it has a focus mechanism that allows it to focus, in theory, from 200 meters to infinity. In practice, we can get down to probably 150 meters. Uh, all the optics are right hard. Uh, they, uh, the optics for all the cameras were made by Optimax and then assembled uh, here. So this is just pictures of our babies, the polycam here, uh, the map cam, SAM cam. And then in addition to the uh, three optical telescopes, we also built a uh, computer control uh, that's basically the interface between the cameras and their focal plane and the spacecraft. So this is the facility in which we built the cameras and tested them. Uh, we use this facility here. This is at the Drake building, which used to be the Phoenix building. I don't know if any of you have been there before. Uh, it's off campus at 6 and Drachman. Uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, vacuum chambers in which we've done all the uh, thermovac testing. Uh, we've done uh, stray light testing. We've done uh, MTF testing and field of view and all sorts of other tests there. And then we've also done something that was new to us, which is a test of how much contamination is coming out of the camera when the camera is in the vacuum. So we basically put the camera in a really good vacuum chamber, and then we heat it up, and then we measure how much materials are condensing on a cold plate. And then we can uh, get a sense of how much, how clean things are. And we had to meet a very, very tight spec because of what I described earlier, that in order to keep the sampling head clean, we have to keep everything that has a view of it clean. So there's just some examples of MTF testing. We also tested the spectral responsivity, which is a combination of the uh, QE of the detector and the filters and the lenses, tested vignetting. Now, because the camera is not going to be operated on Earth, we have to test it in vacuum. We have to test it hot. We have to test it cold. Um, so we also test it before and after it goes to vibe testing. So you know, everything we build before it goes on a spacecraft has to go on a vibration table to simulate what happens at launch. And so we have testing before and after to see if any optical characteristic has changed. And then we also test it at all the various object conjugates that are possible. So for example, the polycam has to work at infinity to do star images to be able to navigate to the asteroid. Also has to be able to take images from 200 meters away. And so we have to have a facility dedicated to basically simulating those different uh, distances and measuring the MTF at all these different uh, distances at all the various temperature, all the various environments. So it's a lot and a lot of testing. For some of the testing, we had to go off-site. Uh, we have a really good collaboration with uh, Space Dynamics Lab at Utah State University. Uh, this is a facility we've used for vibration testing of all the cameras and our uh, computer control module. And also, we've used their stray light uh, testing facility. Uh, this is a polygam under test there, uh, which is a, just a really nice facility. Uh, for the smaller cameras, we were able to do that here, the polycam is large enough that we didn't have a collimator that was big enough to do stray light testing there. And just some, some results. We tested infield stray light. Uh, we tested, uh, just uh, measured the stray light PST. This is for polycam. 
Uh, we had some very, very detailed straylight models. We worked with photon engineering, and uh, we had a student uh, from here, Marvin Waltel, who now works at Raytheon, who did some modeling. And the nice thing is all the features that we observed were predicted. In fact, they were predicted a little worse because we made some conservative choices in terms of uh, optical performance of the materials. Uh, we measured ghosting. The only camera we were able to actually see a ghost is SamCam. Uh, it's a 0.1% level, uh, so we're, we're, we're fine. Uh, in retrospect, we could have done better because when we started looking for the ghost, so SimCam has two modes. It has a mode just for imagine, imaging the asteroid as we get close, and it has a diopter to look at the uh, sample head. When we started looking for the ghost in the sample head images, uh, we couldn't find it. And we realized that the, the way this ghost works is the light comes in the camera. It goes through a, a flat filter, goes through the optics, gets focused on the focal plane. And then from the focal plane, it basically follows the inverse path. So it's focused on the focal plane, comes back out. It hits through, goes through all the optics, hits the filter again. And then from there, it just goes all the way back down. And so when you focus a star here, you get a very dim ghost. Uh, the, uh, the mode that has a diopter in it, the ghost is no longer focused because you don't have something that's focused at the focal plane getting re-imaged back on the focal plane because it's hitting a curved surface. So in retrospect, we actually could have used a, a diopter with no power in it in order to mitigate the ghost. So uh, this is something I was uh, discussing with one of you earlier where, you know, this is two years to launch and you think, well, we could totally fix this. But, you know, this is this marching army and if it's good enough, you just keep going. So you find how you should have done it, but it's way too late by that point to actually change anything. All right, so this is a, a cute family pictures of uh, Polycam, MapCam, and SamCam. Uh, in our lab being tested together. Uh, and then one of the tests that was done is uh, electromagnetic compatibility and electromagnetic interference. Um, what we do here is worry that the electromagnetic uh, waves that come out of the camera could interfere with the spacecraft. And we also worry that emissions from the spacecraft could interfere with the functioning of the camera. So we go to a lab, in this case it was Orbital ATK in Gilbert, and we submit the camera to a whole bunch of uh, interference at, uh, over a broad range of wavelength, and we just listen and we run the camera to see if there's any problems, and we didn't find any. And then in the other thing, we run the camera through all the kinds of operations that we're going to have, move filter wheels, move this, turn motors on, turn heaters on, run the detectors, and listen and see if there's anything coming out of it that's going to interfere with the operation of the spacecraft. And obviously, we wouldn't have gone on if there, we found anything. And so when all this is done, we ship to Lockheed for integration on the spacecraft, and a nice big FedEx truck that we followed very carefully. And then we put everything back together, make sure it works, uh, that nothing happened in shipping. And then once we're done putting it back together, we take it all apart <laughs> to go put it on the spacecraft. And so this is a picture of the spacecraft. You can't really see it because there's a whole bunch of uh, ladders and things, but this is how it was installed on the spacecraft. Uh, and this is the first family portrait of SamCam in the uh, Clean room at Lockheed. There's a couple of people in the audience here. There's Stefan in that picture, and Dathan is right there next to him. And then we can use SamCam to look at the sampling head. And so this is what the head looks like, the real head, and this is zooming in. So the resolution is a fraction of a millimeter. The idea being here that once we go to the asteroid and we get some dirt or whatever on it, when we look back, we'll be able to see it. And that will help make a decision as to whether we really did get material and we're good to stow and come back to Earth, or whether we have to go back for more. The interesting thing is, you know, typically when you build a camera, you put a baffle or you do something to try and keep the sun out of it. Well, SamCam, his job is to image the 
actual sampling event. And so right in the middle of its field of view is a big, bright thing. And we've asked them to paint it black, but they had something about not wanting you know, paint on their sampler mechanism that has to stay pristine. So it's basically polished aluminum. And so we're going to have full sun on something that's polished aluminum as a BRDF of, you know, 25%, 30%, something like that. And right next to the asteroid, which is very dark and has a reflectivity of a few percent. And so what happens is you get images that are not so great. But the good thing is it's not actually blooming. And we're able to uh, remove the charge smear, or Dathan is able to remove the charge smear and get us some images that... Obviously, we don't get a lot of detail in the head, but we, don't, we are able to see a, a black background just fine. All right, so, so some pictures of the spacecraft being built, being integrated. Those are just pretty pictures. Uh, this shows uh, the whole spacecraft here. And that picture is kind of distorted. Uh, anyway, so there's OCAMs here. So this is Polycam, MapCam, and SAMCam here. And the, the CCM is uh, below deck. Uh, right next to us is OTES, and OVS is here. The uh, MIT instrument goes here. Obviously, it wasn't there. And the laser altimeter will go here when it's delivered. <coughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe it's the angle of where I am that makes it look very squished. But. So this is a sampling arm and where it's stowed. That's after the solar panel were installed and the uh, high-gain antenna is installed. This is the whole spacecraft going into um, acoustic testing, I think. <clears throat> so it has you know, MLI blankets on it. And you can see the full complement here, OVRs, OCAM. So this is Polycam, MapCam, SAMCam, OTES. Um, <clears throat> and that's the end of my talk. So if you have any questions. Yeah, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll let you guys go first. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. 